pleasure to introduce Junji from Los, Los Angeles. Hi, my name is June. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Um, I want to thank Bob for inviting me so many times. It's been really hard uh, for me to arrange a schedule to be able to get here on a Thursday. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me, and thanks to all of you for it, having me here. Uh, I, um, I like to start out whenever I'm asked to talk in a meeting by saying two or three things that I think are the most important things that I'll say uh, any time I'm asked to share. And I, I do that um, just in case any of you are anything like me, because sometimes I can only listen to two or three things uh, before I start thinking usually about myself. But I, um, what, what I want to start out by saying is that I am not an expert on alcoholism, on Alcoholics Anonymous, or certainly on anything else that I'll be standing up here and sharing about tonight. I'm just a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm going to do what it suggests that we do in the big book, uh, share in a general way what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like um, now. And um, in case you are new, um, and I know that there are a lot of you here or visiting, uh, I want to just let you know that um, people come to Alcoholics Anonymous in a lot of different ways. And um, oh, I think this one's on. <laughs> Um, Anyway, well, in case you came to Alcoholics Anonymous in a number of different ways, thank you, I'm not very uh, technologically advanced, Uh, I I think that it it doesn't matter how we come into Alcoholics Anonymous, but because people come in so many different ways, I, I like to mention that Alcoholics Anonymous is absolutely free. Sometimes people do come in through treatment centers and and they need to pay or they need insurance or different things. And like I said, I don't think it matters how you get here. But I want to be very clear about the fact that Alcoholics Anonymous itself is absolutely free. Had Alcoholics Anonymous not been free, I never could have come here. Had it not stayed free, I never could have stayed. I was over 10 years sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous before I could afford to put a dollar in the basket, and that wasn't even on a regular basis. So this is not about money, and it's important for me um, to make sure that anybody who's new here might know that. I want to welcome those of you who are new. You know, I talked at a meeting, it's been a while ago now, and a guy came up to me afterwards, um, I think mainly because his sponsor was standing behind him and told him to, but he said, you know, um, I want to thank you for your talk tonight. He said, I don't really believe it was your story, but I liked the way that you told it. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that um, because I thought, you know, it, it, that, that just fascinates me, uh, that this guy could, uh, could doubt that I came from where I came from, that I used to live the way that I used to live. Because, you know, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I looked like my story. And I looked like my story for a hell of a long time after I got here. So I thought, what a tribute to Alcoholics Anonymous that someone could actually doubt that I came from where I came from. Um, I think Alcoholics Anonymous is absolutely amazing. I live a life today that I never would have wanted, and I am a person that I wouldn't have even liked when I came here. Um, And what fascinates me about that is that most of the time I'm pretty comfortable in my own skin and I don't want to trade places with anyone. And that's a fascinating thing for me because I wanted wanted to trade places with anyone always. Before I drank, while I drank, after I got sober. I mean, you know, it was a very long road for me uh, to become comfortable in my own skin. And it's not always like that. I want to thank Nancy um, for sharing and talking about the hope that we find here in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, because that is really very special. I, um, I am a person who stories touch me and, uh, and they help me tremendously. And we were talking a little bit at dinner tonight. I have always attended a lot of speaker meetings in Alcoholics Anonymous um, just because of where I live in Los Angeles. Uh, my home group is the Thursday Night Brentwood uh, Workshop Group. And, um, and I have heard just some amazing, amazing stories and amazing people. I'm very, I feel very lucky to have gotten sober when I got sober. You know, I remember one of the first speakers I heard in my first 30 days was a woman named Sybil. Sybil was the first woman to get sober west of the Mississippi ever, you know. And uh, I was coming, I was less than 30 days, I was sitting at this meeting, and Sybil had almost 32 years. I was just, you know, I mean, it, it was just really mind-boggling. It still would be, you know. And, uh, and she said, you know, 
If I could take the life that I have right now, newcomers, and I could just give it to you, she said, I wouldn't do it. And I thought, you know, well, she's really mean. Do you know, I mean, my life was an absolute disaster, and I'll try and get into sharing a little bit more specifically about that. And I knew, of course, that no one, you know, could have fixed it all, probably. But I thought it was very mean that someone thought if they could, you know, with the magic wand kind of thing, they still wouldn't do it. And I thought, what is that all about, you know? And she said, I wouldn't do it because I wouldn't rob you of the journey. And I think as we stay sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, that becomes truer almost, you know, with each year that passes. Um, I have been amazed at my journey And I've been amazed at the journey of the people that I've watched, you know, around me, those that I've sponsored, those ahead of me, um, and whatever. And that oftentimes is where I get hope, even today, like Nancy was sharing about, you know, um, when I'm in those dark hallways or uh, or when things don't seem to have um, an understanding that I can quite comprehend. You know, um, I'm one of those people that believes I was born an alcoholic, and I don't want to have a philosophical discussion with any of you about that after the meeting, by the way. It's just what I believe. Um, there was something wrong with me, though, before I ever started to drink. Um, and, uh, and I think I just had to add alcohol, and I was already alcoholic. Um, but my first obsession in life was not drinking. It was suicide. And from as far back as I can remember, which is about the age of five years old, I began to try and kill myself on a regular basis. And before I came to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I do not believe that there were any days that I can think of that I didn't try and kill myself, put myself in a position where someone else would take my life, or pray to a God that I was slowly losing faith in to please let me die. Now, I can look back on those earlier years of my life, and I can certainly see that some of my suicide attempts were to get attention. There's no question about that. But by and large, as of tonight, as I look back on my life, i got to tell you, I really wanted out. I wanted to die. I didn't want to go anywhere. I didn't want to meet anybody. I didn't want anything in my life to happen at all. Nothing that I wanted to look forward to at all. I wanted out. And so for someone like me, it may not surprise you when I tell you that I am extremely grateful that I found alcohol. I believe I would have been locked up in some kind of an institution had I not found it. Uh, I um, started to use drugs on a regular basis when I was seven years old. I began to drink on a regular basis when I was eight. By the time I was nine, I found a combination that I never altered in any way. And what that was was barbiturates or reds or yellows or downers, whatever you might know them as, and alcohol. The combined effect of those got me exactly where I needed to go, and that was out. I was not a party girl. I've never had a social drink in my life. Um... I've I've never not been drunk. I've never not overdosed. You know, I mean, it's just I don't know what you why you would want to do that. You know, Um, and fortunately, alcohol worked. It didn't make me feel good. That's why I don't have any funny party stories to tell you. It helped me not feel at all. And thank God I found it when I did. You know, I grew up in an alcoholic home. There was a lot of violence in my home. There were a lot of broken promises in my home. And there were a lot of other things that go on sometimes in alcoholic homes. Um, And I didn't know that it was alcoholism. I just knew that things weren't good. And I wanted out, you know. Uh, I, um, my mom was a bar drinker. And uh, my mom was to be in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for many, many years with varying times of sobriety. Uh, And so I had uh, been in and out of many meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous before I ever uh, got sober. So my mom was one of the slippers um, back then in in that area. And uh, I'm from a town called Venice, um, Venice Beach. And um, when I um, was a little kid, uh, I'd kind of look around, you know, at the people in my life. And I know today most of the people I was looking at were alcoholics. Uh, But I saw men and women in my life handling exactly the same life experiences very differently. Um, I had never seen a man cry that I can remember before I came in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I took that to mean that that was because men do not feel pain. Nothing hurts them. Um, I've seen men stabbed, I've seen them shot, I've seen them arrested, I've seen their kids overdose, I've seen their wives leave them. I mean, I've seen a lot of things happen. I never saw a man shed a tear under any of those circumstances. And again, I took that to mean that nothing could hurt them that much. I saw the women in my life going through those same experiences, um, and most of them had a breaking point. One or more of those experiences caused them to crack 
and cry, and you saw that they were experiencing pain. And I looked at those two different groups of people, and I decided immediately which one I wanted to be like. And I spent my whole life before coming to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and quite a bit of time afterwards trying to be what I thought a man was. And to me, a man was someone who cared about no one, who felt absolutely nothing, and if they did, they never let anyone know it. And the only emotion that men ever experienced or allowed themselves to experience and you to know about was anger and rage. And that's how I wanted to live my life. Um, unfortunately, I seem to be one of those people that Clancy uh, talks about that had no emotional insulation whatsoever. So that absolute strangers could just look at me funny and raise an eyebrow and I would feel like crying. It hurt so much. You know, because I knew they were thinking, she's ugly, she's stupid. You know, what is she doing here? I mean, you know, it was just this whole thing going on. So I had a problem right away um, because the first thing that I ever thought about myself, I just hated me. I hated everything about me. Um, and at that time, I used to beat my hands and fingers and bodies with hammers and burn myself and cut my wrists and just whatever it was, you know. Um, when I was uh, growing up on the streets in Venice, you know, I ran with a gang, and uh, it was very important to me that I do a lot of fighting, and I did. It was important that I be in that gang so that people might think that I was tough. And, you know, um, it's important that I always remember to let you guys know I've never won a fight in my life. You know, um, I never fought less than five people, though. You know, and my sponsor explained to me after I came to the program, if you fight groups of five or more, no one expects you to win. <clears throat> and they think maybe she is kind of tough, or why would that many people have to jump her, you know? But what I learned about myself is that I would much rather you punch me in the face than hurt my feelings. And I tried to make sure that that happened. And take it from me, it happened a lot. I was very good at getting people to punch me in the face. Um, when I was a little kid and uh, they said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, a boy. And uh, it wasn't as easy to do back then as it is today. <laughs> Um, but it wasn't like some days I'd say a teacher and some days I'd say a nurse. I mean, it was a boy all the time. And it really began to concern my family. Um, and so they took me to um, see priests. Um, and then we were on welfare and they found out that I had all these other problems as well. But they found out that they could take me to a psychiatrists and psychologists, and I began to see uh, some different professionals like that. I, I really don't have any kind of diagnosis to give you about what those people thought about what my problems were or what was wrong, because I always felt about those people much like my friend Patty Hicks did, and I thought psychiatrists and psychologists should have to work for their money, and I never told them anything. I never answered one question. I never filled out one form. I never played with one doll. I had absolutely nothing to say to those people. I sat there the required 50 minutes, and when it was over, I got up and I left. Um, so, so consequently, I didn't get a lot of assistance there. Um, somewhere along the line, you know, I kind of accepted, <coughs> excuse me, that I wasn't going to be able to be a boy, and that's when I made the choice, which, as I saw it, there really was only one choice, and that was to be a tough broad. And I spent all my time before coming into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and a lot of it afterwards trying to be what I thought a tough broad was. And I have learned as I have stayed sober in Alcoholics Anonymous and traveled some and gotten to meet different people around the country that actually tough broad um, requirements or, you know, um, whatever, for lack of a better word, requirements, really vary a lot of times geographically depending on where you live. So if you live in Venice Beach, being a tough broad, you've got to have tough feet. Tough broads have tough feet, so you don't wear shoes. You know, it's very important. And um, I would stand down there, you know, with my gang, and I would see, <coughs> excuse me, touristy-looking people kind of looking at us, and I would look them straight in the eye because that's what you're supposed to do if you're tough. And I would take my cigarette, and I would throw it down on the boardwalk, and I would put it out with my bare feet. And sometimes I'd see them, and they'd kind of poke each other and whisper back and forth, and I knew what they were saying. They were saying, Wow. That is one tough broad. And, and I knew they had to be pretty impressed, you know. And again, after I'd been sober for a while, my sponsor said, you know, maybe what some of those people were saying to one another was, did you see that? That person just put flesh to fire. Why would anybody do anything so stupid, you know? But I didn't know there was another way of looking at it, you know. Um, anyway, I... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry about that. I um, I ran around uh, with my gang in the um, in the streets of Venice, and um, 
I went through a series of, uh, of foster homes that I kept getting thrown out of, and um, a series of a lot of different things happening that happen when we're running the streets and practicing our disease. Um, I, um, I was brought to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous by my mother, not because I asked for help, not because I wanted help, not because I admitted having a problem, but just because she thought if she left me alone, I might get her evicted from another apartment. And I came into the meeting that night, and I did not raise my hand because I wasn't an alcoholic, and even if I had been, I wasn't going to join an organization that was allowing my mother to belong to it. Um, So I sat in the meeting. You know, by the time I came to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the only person that I hated more than my mother was me. And I hated my mother for everything that had ever gone wrong in our life, and take it from me, short version, a lot had gone wrong. And I blamed her for everything. In fact, the first time I talked at my home group, I was about nine months sober. They had me talk at the Monday Night Venice group. That was my home group then. Um, I was the 15-minute speaker. And when I finished, the secretary came over to me, and he said, you know, if we had wanted to hear your mother's story, we would have asked her to talk. Um, That's how wrapped up I was in it being all her fault. But anyway, and that lasted for quite a while. Um, I... uh, I came to that meeting, and the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous began for me that night, even though I didn't get sober. And it began because there was a guy in that meeting that I admired more than anyone else in the whole world. And some of you are definitely not going to identify with that, uh, with the reasons I'm going to share with you, but they were my reasons, and so I I need to share them. You know, if I had to tell you what I wanted out of life in one sentence when I came to the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, all I wanted was the ability to walk into a room full of strangers and have everyone there back away from me in terror. Now, when you're 87 pounds, that almost never happens. And there was this guy at the meeting that night named Paul, and he was a drinking buddy of my mother's. And he drank with my mom (coughs) in in some of the roughest bars that I've ever heard about um, in Venice Beach. And, you know, when Paul had been drinking, if he wanted to sit at your table, you didn't talk about it or discuss it. You just gave him the whole table because you did not know and you didn't want to find out what he was going to do to get the table. And I looked at that man and I thought, wow. He had achieved everything that I wanted in life, the ability to clear rooms and tables, and he was sitting in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was very impressed. I just thought it was for weak people like my mom, you know, who lost all the fights I saw her in. So I was really impressed that this guy was coming to AA. And he was there that night, you know, and he had his knife in his motorcycle, and he'd just gotten out of jail. And, you know, we talked a little bit after the meeting, and I went out and got drunk the next day. And then I came back to some meetings. And I did not raise my hand still, but I went to meetings. um, And I spent my time in between the meetings talking to Paul. He was the only person I was willing to talk to. And I explained to him that I wasn't an alcoholic, that I couldn't possibly be an alcoholic, that I wasn't anything like my mother, who was very alcoholic, and we all knew was alcoholic, you know, that I was young. I had places to go, people to see, things to do. I had my whole life ahead of me, and I was clearly not alcoholic. And he turned to me and he said, you know, June, I'm pretty new in this AA thing right now. And he said, and they tell me I can't diagnose anybody's disease but my own. He said, but in your case, I'm going to make an exception. He said, I've seen the way that you drink, and I've seen the way that you use chemicals, and I happen to believe if you don't come into this program and take what these people have to offer you, you're going to be, in six months or less, you're going to be on the streets, you're going to be selling your ass, you're going to be shooting stuff. And I knew he wasn't trying to make up some story, not like your teacher might do in high school about something they don't know anything about. He was just talking about facts. He was just talking about things that had happened and were beginning to happen in my life, things that had happened in his life. And I thought a little bit about what he said, but I did not want to join Alcoholics Anonymous. I just thought it can't be that bad, really. I mean, what could be worse, you know? And then in that two-week period of time, absolutely every alternative (coughs) but Alcoholics Anonymous (coughs) excuse me, was removed from my life. I was living with my mother at that time, as I mentioned. That's why she took me to that meeting uh, when she was worried about getting evicted. And um, she was newly sober at that time. And I've already mentioned how I felt about my mother and that I hated myself about a hundred times more than her, and I was just filled with hatred. And my mom and I used to have fights, and they were physical. And she was sober, and she didn't think she had to be subjected to those kind of physical fights in her apartment anymore. And she asked me to leave, and I did. The rest of my family did not allow me to come by 
or call, and I didn't bother trying. I had been in a number of foster homes. I had I was not in, allowed to go back to any of them. I tried to get into some of the drug rehab and alcohol recovery homes that were in the Los Angeles area. There were not that many at that time, but there were some. None of them would take me, some because of my age and some because of my attitude. There was a program back then called Synanon, um, and I had attended games there. And... Uh, they wouldn't take me either, and that was really bad because they were actually desperate for membership at the time. Um, so things were looking kind of grim, but I thought, you know, who cares? Who cares about programs, you know, those families? You know, none of that really matters. If you're a tough broad, the only thing that's important, the only thing that matters at all is your gang. And then one day as I walked down an alley, all five members of my own gang beat me up. And I found myself sitting in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was 87 pounds. I had a black eye. I had a swollen lip. I had no shoes. wouldn't have worn shoes if I had them. I had no family that wanted anything to do with me. I had no money. I had no place to stay. And I raised my hand in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. You can see where it was really kind of simple. You know, it wasn't like, would you like to go to Hawaii or join AA? You know, it was just sort of, that was it, you know. And I, I raised my hand in those meetings, and I know today that there were people in those meetings that did not know about the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. I certainly didn't know about them then. Um, and I know that they did not know about those traditions um, because when I raised my hand in those meetings, some of those people came up to me afterwards, and they knew who I was because my mother had been a slipper in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for so many years. They knew I was her daughter, and they knew how old I was. And they came over to me, and they said, you know, you're too young, and we don't want little kids in our meetings while we talk about serious things. And if you come back to this meeting, we're going to get together and throw you out. And I didn't know that Alcoholics Anonymous has a third tradition that says the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking and that no one anywhere can throw you out of a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous or anyone else for any reason if you have that desire to stop drinking. I didn't know that. I don't think that they knew that either. I just thought AA didn't want me either. And that was okay with me because I didn't want me either. And I hadn't for a long time. And I fell back on the answer that I'd been using since I was five years old. I went over to a friend of my mother's house. I went in her <coughs> sorry, bathroom, which is the first place I went at anyone's house I ever visited. And I went in there to find enough of the kind of pills that I needed to kill myself, and I took enough of them to do it. And then I went to a noon meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And by the time I got to that meeting, I could not stand and I could not sit. I had to lay in the meeting. I don't know about where you guys go to meetings around the Vegas area, but in Los Angeles where I got sober, they almost never called on people to share who were laying in the meeting. <laughs> but for some reason that day they did call on me. Uh, they realized right away that I needed to be in a hospital. Uh, and that's where I came to. Uh, a doctor was giving me medicine or something to make me throw up. And he explained that the pills I had taken were to slow down my heart. And had I been there five or ten minutes later, I would have been in a coma that they probably couldn't have brought me out of. And I really don't know why that overdose was any different than all the others that I had inflicted upon myself. I just know that it was. Because since that time, one day at a time, I haven't taken anything that affects me from the neck up. That's how I personally define sobriety. Uh, I am... Um, you know, I got very active in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I went to 21 meetings a week most of the first couple of years that I was sober, and I think a lot of it had to do with what Nancy was sharing about. I really wasn't sure this was going to work for me. And truthfully, I think a lot of other people weren't sure it was going to either, you know. Um, and I'm not just guessing at that, by the way. It's It's been um, conveyed to me on more than one occasion, you know. I... I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm so grateful for the old-timers that were here. Uh, they are so much more tolerant than I uh, ever think I will get to be. Um, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and it may not surprise you, but I, I want to let you know, I came into this program with a very bad attitude. I did not like me. I didn't like my mother. And I didn't really think any of the other women around here had anything that I'd be interested in knowing anything about. I did not sit next to women. I did not shake hands with women. I most certainly did not hug women. And I did not like listening to women speakers, which always makes me feel better because I know there are never as many people listening to me as it looks like. <clears throat> the men that I had known in my life were extremely violent. They were mostly alcoholic. I figure that's probably the way most of the guys around here were, too, and I didn't like them either. And I had a problem because when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, all we had were men and women, and I didn't like any of them. But I went to 21 meetings a week anyway, and I got a commitment at every one of those meetings. It was not because I wanted to get a gold star in AA. It was because I had absolutely no place else to go. No one wanted to be with me, around me, you know. 
Um, I just would get to meetings. I would walk in between to the other meetings. I did not get a lot of rides. I didn't ask for rides. <coughs> I smoked three packs of cigarettes a day when I came to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I lit all of them myself. Occasionally, someone would hold a match, and I allowed them to hold it as long as they liked. They never lit my cigarette with it. After I'd been sober a while, I took up smoking cigars and then later a pipe. I did not wear shoes most of the first two years that I was sober. I had some motorcycle chains that I wore on my wrist and my ankle. I had a jacket that on the back said, do unto others and then split. (laughs) It was my own spiritual philosophy. I had a very limited vocabulary. It consisted almost solely of profanity. There were a few exceptions, the and mother. Um, I found a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous were extremely offended by the use of that type of language, and so I tried to use it more when they got near me. And um, I want to let you know that I was able to sit in a meeting almost this big and have an entire row all to myself. And that's why I'm so grateful to the people who tolerated me, you know. And I was, I remember, I was, uh, I had the greeting commitment (laughs) at the Tuesday night Westwood meeting. And I would stand back there barefoot with my cigar and motorcycle chains and jacket, welcoming the newcomers (coughs) as they came to AA. (coughs) And sometimes I'd hear their sponsors kind of whisper to them, you see, if you keep drinking, you can end up like that. When I came to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, people who did not know me were guessing my age at 37. I was 13. And um, I have to tell you, I don't know when it's going to quite catch up, because I know that uh, eventually we do start to have a lot of fear about aging, I suppose, or something. But I was a couple thousand years older then than I feel tonight. And I don't know how Alcoholics Anonymous accomplished that. I never ever believed, no matter how much hope there was here in Alcoholics Anonymous, that that feeling of being old and having it all be over would ever completely go away. I just didn't think there was enough power anywhere to make that happen, to make me forget, really, in a sense, how I used to live and what I had done to others and to myself. Um, But at the same time... (laughs) (coughs) There was hope in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, one of the things I learned, too, as I've traveled and gotten to meet people about tough broads is that, you know, there's a big makeup-wearing tough broad group, and then there is a non-makeup-wearing tough group. I was in the non-makeup-wearing tough broad group because I never would have stood in front of a mirror long enough to look at myself because I hated everything about me. And makeup wasn't going to make it any different, and I already knew that, you know. Um, And the hope that I felt when I would listen to people share in Alcoholics Anonymous, these amazing people, to talk about how they had reached a point of pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization, and that somehow through the process, you know, of working these steps and finding a spiritual solution, they had gotten to a point where they had self-respect, where they could walk on the sunny side of the street, where they could look other people right in the eye and know that they were one of God's kids. I would listen to those people, and I believed them. I did not believe that that could really happen for me, but I did believe if I tried Alcoholics Anonymous as hard as I possibly could, that maybe one day, as I was walking down one of those streets where you can't help but catch your reflection in one of those storefront windows, maybe I wouldn't feel like throwing up at who I was and where I'd been. You know, and that kind of thing. And that kept me coming back in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I, um, oh, let's see, where will I go? You know, I thought about this today. I, I sort of wore this dress. It's, it's almost like my own little personal joke, you know, because I, I didn't wear anything. I wouldn't sit in a row where there was anything pink until I was over 10 years sober. And, um, and I was thinking this morning, you know, as I was trying to pick out what I was going to wear, I was thinking about Patty Hicks, uh, who I got sober with. And Patty always dressed unbelievably, you know. Um, and um, and <coughs> she and her sponsor talked a lot <coughs> sorry <coughs> about wearing your sobriety you know and uh, and trying to be respectful and honoring alcoholics anonymous but you know i couldn't have worn pink for many years after i got sober in the program of alcoholics anonymous um, because i thought that pink meant that you were soft and weak and those kind of things 
And that was just not an acceptable thought for me to even begin to have. And I would talk to my first sponsor in the early months, and she would say, you know, June, there's a difference between being tough and being strong. And I thought, that's ridiculous. You know, she's just one of those educated people who's trying to trick me with words. Because, you know, it ain't, there ain't any difference. And I need to be tough. But the interesting thing is that over the years, through the process of what's happened in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm not tough at all, but I am stronger than I have ever been. What fascinates me about it is that in all the early years of my sobriety and all my life before, I wanted to make sure that nobody ever hurt my feelings in any way that I could come up with trying to have that happen. And I got my feelings hurt all the time. And today, the life that I live now, there are more people in the world who can hurt my feelings and know about it, and they hardly ever do. It's such a fascinating thing, you know. And I am stronger than I ever thought that I could be. I'm strong enough. I can wear pink. And I'm just as strong as if I had my black leather jacket, you know. It doesn't have anything to do with how I feel inside. And I don't know when that transformation exactly happened. Um, but it's been an interesting one. I... Um, Let's see, where will I go here? Well, when I came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have a seventh grade education. Uh, I dropped out of school after I'd been sober for a while. I had a lot of problems. You know, I was listening as I came over here, <clears throat> as I drove uh, here today. I was listening to some tapes of Chuck C. and uh, some CDs of Chuck C. And uh, he was talking about, you know, um, how most of us come in here with a lot of related disorders, you know. And... Uh, and I was wanted in different states. I was facing deportation uh, for being illegally in the country in the early uh, months and years of my sobriety. I mean, I had a lot of related disorders. You know, I didn't have any place to live. I had a bad attitude. I have a seventh grade education. I couldn't get a job. You know, there were problems. Um, I was turned into the authorities, and um, there was I was facing juvenile hall after I was sober just because I didn't have any place to live, and, you know, nobody really could take me in and you know there were just a lot of things going on and I and I was thinking about it you know as I drove here you know remembering those related disorders the different ones I remember when I was facing the deportation <laughs> I went to my uh, I was going to go the next day to find out some more stuff and I was at the Monday night you know home group um, my Monday night home group the Monday night Venice group and I remember I was talking to one of my friends there and I said you know I got to go to got to go to court tomorrow and they go you know I'm going to pray for God's will for you, kid. And I'm like, don't do that. I mean, geez, I mean, I couldn't think of anything worse. You know, don't ask him, you know, how bad could it get? I had a terror, you know, sort of like Nancy was talking about. I was terrified of the idea of God. I always believed in God. And um, <clears throat> I was trying to fly under the radar, hoping maybe he could be busy with everybody else and just not quite get to me. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> after I'd been sober for a while, I had a lot of different kinds of jobs, you know, and um, and I lost a lot of jobs. Uh, I, I was thinking about that today, too. I, I think one of the great things about Alcoholics Anonymous that I hope you know if you're new or if you've been around a while and you're in one of your dark hallways or whatever, I, I hope that you try to remember that you don't have to drink to start over. I have started over a lot of times in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and um, and I'm very grateful that we're allowed uh, the opportunity to do that and that there's people around to guide us and sort of show us, you know, when we need to do that. I had a lot of jobs um, because I really was a flake, you know, really. Um, I mean, my sponsor just, you know, rolled her eyes like all the time. But, you know, I was the kind of person I'd go to work. Well, sometimes. But sometimes I felt like I needed a meeting, you know, and so I'd go to a meeting and then they'd fire me. You know, they were not understanding. Um, as soon as I'd be at work and I'd go up and I'd say, you know, I'm an alcoholic and I need to leave and go to a meeting. And um, they weren't understanding about that either, you know. I can remember I'd go to coffee after the meeting and I'd stay out with the group that was staying out the latest. And so it would be one or two in the morning and then I'd go stay on someone's couch, whoever that might be. And I'd think, well, you know, I'd talk to my higher power. I was practicing. I'd say, all right, look, God, i got to be at work at 8 in the morning. If it's your will, make sure I'm up by 7 or I'm not going to make it. And invariably, it wasn't God's will for me to work there either, you know. And, um, and then I can remember, you know, those one day at a time things. You know, you'd get your check and you'd think, well, it's one day at a time, you know. So you just spend it all, you know, and then you wouldn't have any money, you know. Um, anyway, and so what my sponsor told me, though, was that, you know, she wanted me to go back to school. And she wanted me to get an education and she wanted me to get a high school diploma. But 
I didn't want any of that stuff. Um, and so she said, okay, fine, then you're going to get the kind of jobs that people with seventh grade educations get. And that's what I did. And I got those kind of jobs, and I went to lots and lots of meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I stayed very active in service, and I learned a lot about service, and I'm very, very grateful that I did. I was taught about the traditions and the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think it's one of the greatest gifts that I was given. Um, I, um, I think that my service uh, work that I was taught in Alcoholics Anonymous is what I truly believe was what caused the transformation in my life. You know, when I was... Uh, listening to uh, some other CDs as I was coming out here. You know, it's kind of the, the difference um, between, you know, learning how to give something back. And I never thought I had anything to give. You know, I didn't like anything about me. Um, and it talks about that in the promises. You know, that feeling of uselessness and self-pity will leave us, you know. I, um, well, I'll tell you this little story since I'm jumping all around. I, I was about seven years sober, I think which isn't very fast, in my opinion, for things changing. But I think I was around, maybe I was five years sober. I'm not really sure. But I, I'll say five. I was about five years sober. I went to the uh, Palm Springs Roundup. And um, <clears throat> I still had never had enough money to buy myself my own dress or a pair of shoes or anything new. And Patty Hicks had given me a dress to wear to that banquet because you kind of had to wear a dress, so I did. And... Um, and I was wearing a brown dress that night. And then I was comparing myself to everyone else in the room, something I still do on days when I want to feel bad, you know. And uh, I was looking around, and I saw this really cool black dress, and I go, wow, that is a great dress. I talked to myself. I go, yeah, it really is. And I thought, well, don't you wish you were wearing that black dress? And I go, no, I'm kind of glad I'm wearing this brown dress. I was like, what are you kidding? I thought, wait a minute, green is your absolute favorite color. So how about that green dress over there? I mean, isn't that incredible? Yeah, yeah, that's great dress. Don't you wish you were wearing the green dress? I'm like, no. I'm kind of glad I'm wearing this brown dress. And then I started asking myself other things. You know, I, I mean, I didn't even want to be blonde or stacked or anything. You know what I mean? It was like I just wanted to be me. I wanted to be living where I was living. I wanted to have the mom that I had. I wanted to be from Venice. I wanted to be in my home group. I wanted to be sitting at that table wearing a brown dress. And more incredible than all of that, which was really just mind-boggling to me, for the first time in my entire life, including before drinking, during drinking, in sobriety, at that moment, I wanted to feel like I was feeling. And I absolutely couldn't believe it. It was the first time there was no pain, and I didn't want to trade places with anybody else, you know. And I think it would make a much better story if I could tell you that from that moment to this, it's always like that. It's not. You know, sort of like my friend Earl, you know, Hightower says, <coughs> I have problems today. You know, but all the problems today that I have are in areas in which I didn't even have areas when I came to the program, you know. So it's, it's really, you know, I, I mean, it's a gift, really. Uh, I, um, I did eventually go back to school. I did take a GED and get an equivalent to a high school, uh, you know, diploma. Um, I started to take some classes at college. I started out by taking what they call, <coughs> excuse me, a dummy English class because my mind was not capable of uh, holding an idea in, in its head. You know, I would read the big book and I couldn't keep a whole sentence in my head. I just didn't know if I'd done too much damage to my brain and it was ever going to work or not, you know. So I wanted to take this class and I did. And then eventually it led into some other classes and I was able to get a job on campus as well as off campus and I kind of cleaned apartments on the weekends and so I was able to start going to school more and more. And after a couple of years, they called me in and they told me I had completed the requirements for what they called an AA degree. And I thought that was a good name for a degree. I never wanted a college degree. I wasn't really thinking it was ever going to happen, but I, I, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, and, you know, when I graduated... <clears throat> that day from that city college, um, my members of my family were there. Both of my sponsors were there. And they announced that I was graduating third in my class out of almost 500 students. And, you know, I, I just, you know, I never fail to think about that in the sense of when I would stand back there at the Tuesday night Westwood meeting, after I had greeted four or five people, I would have trouble remembering which name was mine. Because I'd heard so many. I'd heard five by then, and I couldn't remember if I was Kathy or Susan or June or whatever, you know. And I couldn't read that whole sentence in the big book and have it come together. So how could that have happened? And I just knew that it had very little to do with me. And I still believe that. 
I think that it was something that Alcoholics Anonymous was able to accomplish. Uh, I, um, I was able to continue, and I did. I applied to go on to a university, and I was accepted at a university, and I continued, and uh, I completed that. And then I'd come up with this dream, and my sponsor told me I had to do the same footwork anybody in or out of AA has to do to make a dream come true, and I did that footwork. Um, I received a telegram. Uh, it's been almost 20 years now. Uh, I think, and uh, and that telegram said that I'd been accepted as one of 300 out of 3,000 applicants to go to law school. And I had always planned on spending a lot of time in court, <laughs> um, but never on that side of the table. And uh, and I was able to go to law school and uh, and to show up one day at a time. And it was a very interesting time. And I think that despite the fact that I had to learn a lot of stuff to become a lawyer, some of the most important things that I learned there were the spiritual lessons that I learned because that was where I really began to believe that we're all God's kids, that nobody's necessarily better, you know, than I am because of their background, because their parents were all judges or doctors or whatever, which is how I felt when I went there and I hadn't even had a high school diploma and it seemed like everybody else was like a sixth-generation genius, you know. Um, I just, you know, showed up, and I began to learn, you know, that whether people are in or out of Alcoholics Anonymous, that we're all God's kids, you know, and uh, and I was able to practice that one day at a time of <coughs> showing up <coughs> and seeing, you know, what could happen in my life. I want to tell you a little bit about my sponsor, Gail Wilson. Um, when I came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I've already told you a little bit about how I felt about women, and uh, Gail was a woman. Um, that is a name, of course, that could be a guy name, so I just want to throw that out there. Gail was a woman. And um, I still can't believe that I was able somehow, that I just consider it. When I think of Gail, I think about the book where it says, we are people who normally would not mix. And Gail, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> she became my sponsor because, and she told me this later, she had been told to never say no to an AA request. I mean, that was just simply it. She said, you know, when I saw you and I met you, she said, I knew that you were not going to make it. She said, I knew with your attitude and your background, you were going absolutely nowhere. But I had been told not to say no if someone asked me to sponsor them. And so she agreed to sponsor me. Now, you know, Gail was three times my age (coughs) when I met her. Um, She had been raised in a warm, loving family. I hated people like that. She had a car. I hated people like that. She had traveled around the world. I'd left Venice once and made it three miles east to Culver City. I hated people like that. Um, We didn't have a car, you know. And um, she not only didn't use the same words that I used, she didn't know what a lot of the words I was using meant. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) And as if that wasn't bad enough, she had been seen in public on numerous occasions wearing pink. So it was just, you know, that kind of a thing where it just wasn't going to really work. And, you know, it's so funny. I would see her at the Thursday night Brentwood meeting, which was her home group at the time, the meeting I hated the most in the world at the time. And I would go there barefoot with my cigar, and I'd go up and say, Hi, Gail. And she'd say, Now, look, don't sit next to me at the meeting tonight. I can't take the cigar smoke. And she said, And not only that, please don't tell anyone that I am your sponsor. And, you know, and that was fine with me because <coughs> I didn't want anybody to know I was hanging out with someone lame like her, you know. And so we'd kind of meet secretly after the meetings, you know, and talk about AA. And um, anyway, <coughs> when, uh, when I was in law school <clears throat> in the last year and Gail uh, had had a lot to do with helping me, she had written a letter um, to help me get into law school. And she knew some lawyers. <clears throat> I knew one lawyer uh, in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, Clint H., and I had, didn't know any other lawyers. And so she knew a few lawyers, and she had a luncheon and introduced them to me, and they wrote a letter, you know, suggesting that maybe this school might consider <clears throat> accepting me. So she did a lot to kind of help make my dreams come true. Um, and in that last year of law school, it became clear that Gail was dying of cancer, in her 40s, and um, I spent a lot of time in the hospital room with her, and um, 
no matter who ever came in that room, and a lot of people were coming in and out in those last months of her life, she would stop them. And she'd say, Nurse Smith, I want you to meet Junie. Junie's like a daughter to me, and she's going to become an attorney. You know, and I thought, you know, this is the same woman that used to say, don't sit next to me at the meeting and don't tell anyone that I am your sponsor. And now she's introducing me to absolute strangers who have no interest in meeting me, I might add, you know. Um, <clears throat> and so we sat and we talked, you know, in those uh, couple of months while we were in the hospital. And that's, again, that's where she verified that she had agreed to become my sponsor because she'd been told not to say no, you know, to an AA request. And she said, you know, in June, she said, you were such a flake. You couldn't keep a job. I mean, you know, you couldn't do anything. The only thing that you did right was you kept your commitments in Alcoholics Anonymous. You kept showing up where you said you would in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. And she said, and uh, I remember when you called me up and you said, I'm going to take a class at the city college. She said, I knew you wouldn't finish. You hadn't finished anything yet. She said, but I didn't say anything. She said, and then you called me up after you'd taken just a few classes, really. I mean, you know, maybe a couple semesters. And you said, Gail... I think I know what I want to do. I think I want to go to law school. She said, I had to force myself not to laugh out loud. She said, that was seven years down the road. And she said, and I knew it wasn't possible. And what we talked about was, how come she didn't tell me? How come she didn't say June? (laughs) I mean, give me a break here. You have a seventh grade education. You know, I mean, you have, you've never had a job for six months in your life. You're totally incapable of doing anything other than, like, you know, literature at the, you know, at the meeting. I mean, you know, you don't drive. You still are barely wearing shoes. I mean, you know, it's just this is really not going to happen for you, you know. And we talked about that, and she said, you know, I didn't tell you that because she said, not because I believed in June, because she said I never thought June could do any of it. She said, but I always believed in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had seen things happen in Alcoholics Anonymous that I didn't think could happen. And that's why she didn't tell me you can't. Couldn't happen. Not for someone like you. Not possible. You know. Um, Gail did pass away in um, April of 1983. And I graduated um, in May of 1983 uh, from law school. And I was uh, able to get a job. It's a job that I still have today. And uh, and it's a job where I, I believe I'm able to be of service. And it is a job where every day that I'm at work, I I remember and know where I would be were it not for a program called Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, um, I'll tell you this one other little thing, and then I'm going to tell you my little finishing thing. After I'd been working in my office for, I'm thinking maybe about seven years, um, my boss called me in, and I work in an office with over 600, it was 600 people, lawyers at the time. And he said, we want to put you in charge of training uh, some of the new lawyers. And he said, because we love your attitude. <laughs> and I just, you know, I, I just can't help but think about that. I thought, you know, in 1972, let me just let you know, nobody here thought I was going to get a job one day because of my attitude, you know. <laughs> uh, when I came to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, there was a speaker. And I strongly encourage you, if you're ever interested or willing in listening to a CD or a tape, um, this person's name was Norm Alpey. And I suppose all of us hear different people, and they are special when we come into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. But for me, every time I heard Norm Alpey talk, after the meeting, I'd want to run up and join AA. And then I'd remember I already belonged, or I wouldn't have been there, you know. Um, so that's how it was for me when I would hear Norm. And, um, and what Norm would say, you know, whenever he would talk, and what I have stolen from him, uh, as we so often do uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, is the way that I usually close. And that is to say, you know, but for the grace of God, people like you, rooms like this, I could have missed it all. Thanks for not letting me. Thank you for listening. If you have enjoyed this recording and would like to listen to other talks on recovery, please visit our free website at recoveryspeakers.com. We have assembled the largest historical recovery audio library in the world and are adding new talks each day.